I think that uh, how the imagination got such a hold on us was that we accepted into our diet catalysts that we were unaware of that pushed our mental state around, uh, specifically psychedelics of various sorts. And a reasonable working definition of psychedelics, what they do, whether you're for it or against it, whether you think it triggers paranoia or, or uh, ataraxia, uh, they are catalysts for the imagination. They catalyze thought. They, they, thought becomes more baroque. It reaches deeper into reality for data. It sees forms of connectivity that previously escaped it. It makes assumption leaps of assumption, not always correct, but sometimes correct. So what it does is by, uh, to some degree, transferring chaos into the mental world, it creates a much richer dynamic and um, and so thought processes become more complicated and in a sense then uh, language becomes the behavior which expresses the imagination Uh, it, it can be expressed in a limited form through dance through gesture and of course, it can be expressed very well through painting if you've reached the stage where you have painting and are not chipping rock or, or drawing in blood in the sand or something like that. But if you have really a, a rich uh, technology behind your artistic intent, uh, but that rich technology would never have arisen without the intercession of language. and. So these two things, which make us unique among nature's productions on this planet, imagination and language seem to be almost like the exterior and interior manifestation of the same thing, the same phenomenon. And what it is, is it's a facility with data an ability to connect it in novel ways uh, for one's own entertainment and amusement, if nothing else. Storytelling is obviously this kind of activity where modules, a ghost, a princess, a lost kingdom, a a disturbed father-son relationship, these modules are manipulated to entertain people. And you know, it's a cliche that there are only five stories. And I think Robert Graves in The White Goddess argued there's only one story. And we keep telling variants of this story over and over again. Well, uh, what history then is, or what culture is, is um, the the phenomenon that attends the rise and spread of the imagination in the human species. But because the imagination works on this what-if model, it always tends toward idealism. In other words, it, it, it is not simply a, a networked process. It's a networked process with a vector field. In other words, it's going somewhere. It's not just a random walk. It's headed somewhere. We idealize. If you're going to play the game, what if, uh, most people who are psychologically healthy don't sit around entertaining dire possibilities. What if? I get a terrible disease. What if I'm run over by a truck? No, people say, what if I make a lot of money? What if I meet somebody who gives me a lot of money? And it, you know, <laughs> it begins to tend toward idealism. And we are obviously 
uh, ruled by ideals and ideas. Uh, we haven't found a good one yet, but we certainly have sacrificed a lot of blood and time in the process of discovering a whole bunch of bad ideas. And we haven't lost our faith in ideas, even though human history is the record. Not one idea has survived from the distant past uh, in its original form. Uh, and some of the most persistent ideas, I would argue, are some of the most pernicious ideas. I mean, the idea of man's inherent uh, uh, flaw, that's an old, old idea, and how much suffering has existed because of it. Uh, but culture, then, is the record of the human imagination. Well, that's fine. That is of interest to anthropologists and somebody else who knows. What gives the whole thing a lot of bite is that more and more the imagination is where we spend our time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about virtual reality, a, an immersive state-of-the-art technology in which you put on goggles and special clothing or enter special environments, and then you are in artificial worlds created by computers. And this is thought to be very woo-woo and far out. But in fact, if you're paying attention, we've been living inside virtual realities for about 10,000 years. I mean, what is a city but a complete denial of nature? And say, no, no, not trees, mud holes, waterfalls, and all that. Straight lines, laid out roads, uh, Class hierarchies reflected in local geography, meaning the rich people live here, surrounded by the not-so-rich people, all served by the poor people, who are so glad they're not the outcast people. Uh, so, uh, you know, urbanization is essentially the first of these impulses where society leaves nature and enters into its own private Idaho. Uh, and uh, the, the growth of cities and the growth of the uh, immediacy, I guess you would say, of the urban experience has been a constant of human evolution since urbanization began. Uh, now, the only difference that the new technologies offer is we are going to do this with light not mortar, brick, steel, aluminum, and titanium, which are incredibly intractable materials. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. We started with the toughest stuff. And, uh, uh, and of course, it cost enormous amounts of human blood and treasure to work with such intractable materials. It's always been amazing to me that the largest buildings human beings ever built are, in a sense, the first buildings human beings ever built, because the pyramids of Egypt are enormous, even by modern scale, and yet they were among the earliest buildings uh, ever built. In virtual reality, the difference between a hundred-story building and a ten-story building is one zero. That's all in a line of code. You specify 100 over 10, and you get a 100-story building instead of a 10-story building. Uh, what this should tell us is that in the domain of light, the intractability of matter is overcome. And so we are on the brink of a time. We, are, we have arrived. We are at the time where the human imagination now need meet no barriers to its intent. And so we are going to find out who we are. We are going to discover what it means to be human when there is no resistance to human will. 
but these are the things I'm thinking about. History feels very risky to a lot of people. I think there, that it is risky, but it is because the stakes are so high. We really have an opportunity to transcend ourselves and to fulfill the human enterprise on this planet. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so aware of the limitations of the people of the past, their agonies, their concerns. I mean, how many children died, were born, stillborn? How many women died in childbirth? Nine times in the last five million years, the glaciers have drowned south from the poles pushing everything in their path. Those people didn't drop the ball. Uh, the amount of human suffering and agony that has gone into carrying us to this moment of privilege and opportunity is incalculable and can only be redeemed if we bring this inherent human beauty uh, into the world as spiritual food for ourselves and for the human community.